Take your Bibles, Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. First book of the Bible is Genesis. Second one is Exodus. You know that we are on Sunday nights going through the life of Moses. Pastor, why would we look at his life? There is no name in the Old Testament mentioned more than Moses' name. We know that Moses' name is mentioned 648 times just in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. After that, he's mentioned 200 more times. And unlike many of the other characters in the Bible, we know things from Moses' birth all the way to his death. We have, through these last number of weeks, we've looked at the early choices of Moses. We've looked at the call of Moses. We've looked at the plagues of Moses. We find ourselves tonight in Exodus chapter 14, and I'd like you to read with me, reading together, reading out loud, verse 1, 2, and 3. Exodus chapter 14, verse 1, 2, and 3. There's a few difficult names in verse 2. Just kind of mumble your way through, and we'll all sound like we're saying the exact same thing. Exodus 14, let's begin out loud, verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp in Piharoth, between Migdol and the sea, over against Baal Zephon, before it you shall encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land. The wilderness hath shut them in. Let's pray. Father, again we thank you for each one that's here tonight. Thank you for the privilege that we have to gather Thank you for the freedom that we enjoy together inside. And Father, we are blessed to have some visitors tonight. We're grateful for each one. But Father, the most welcome guest tonight is you. We pray that you, the Spirit of God, would speak to our hearts tonight. Help us. And Lord, this is a familiar story, what we're reading in Exodus 14. But maybe the application isn't quite as familiar. I pray that you'd open our understanding that we would see how this applies to us here almost 3,500 years later. Help us tonight, Lord. Fill me with your spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you remember last time, we were in the end of Exodus 12 and then all of Exodus 13. And what is said was that the nation of Israel had just been delivered from Egypt. And so what we saw last time was we saw the starting of their journey. And you know the starting of their journey is like just like the starting of every believer's journey. If you have ever trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, that began your Christian life. But it wasn't the end of it. God had so many other things planned for you and me beside being saved. And so we saw some parallels, or the, the, I guess the theological word is the type, and it was a type of the starting of every Christian's life. We saw when we looked at the moment of the starting of every believer's journey, you can look back to a moment when you trusted Christ. We looked there at the multitude at the starting, and many, many people in the Scriptures took this journey. And aren't you glad you're not the only one that's taking this trip from salvation to heaven? We looked there at the memorials and there were some things along the way that God wanted them to do to remember what the Lord had done in saving them. And then we looked at the movement's preacher. What are we looking at tonight? Tonight we're looking at Exodus chapter 14, and we're looking at the whole chapter. And what we're going to find is no sooner had Israel departed from Egypt than the Egyptians changed their mind. See, Egypt has said, go, get out of here. We, the land is devastated. Go. But no sooner had they let Israel go than Egypt changed their mind. We'll find that in chapter 14. And Pharaoh and his armies began to chase after Israel. And it seemed that Israel was boxed in into a corner and there was no way to escape. They had the Red Sea ahead of them. They had the mountains on either side of them. And they had the Egyptian army that was furious with them. It looked like they had no way to get out. And they began to criticize Moses and say, this is all a big mistake. And it would have been better for us to have stayed in Egypt than for us to die here in the wilderness. And to their complaint, Moses said these words. Look there in verse 13. Exodus 14 and verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, 
Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Keep reading there in verse 14, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. And so he said, none of this is a mistake. And you know, as I, whenever to this week, whenever I've read Exodus 14, the type that I've always seen in Exodus 14 is the fact that this nation goes through this dry, and it's water on this side and water on this side, and there's a cloud above them. And really, it's a perfect picture of baptism. And isn't it true? Shortly after you get saved, the next step is baptism. That's certainly in the type here, but we're not preaching tonight on baptism. Tonight I'm preaching on the fact that they came to an insurmountable trouble and a barrier that they thought there's no way to get past this. And they began to cry and they began to moan and they began to complain to Moses, how dare you, why would you do this? And yet God brought them there because God was going to do something so supernatural that from that point forward, they would look back at the crossing of the Red Sea and say, that was God. You know, we here in the New Testament, we look back at the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And to us, that's the moment that we look back on and say, that's God. Do you know, in the Old Testament, before Calvary ever happened, they look back at the Red Sea and say, that was God. Keep your hand there in Exodus 14. Uh, look with me, if you would, in Joshua chapter number 2. After Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua chapter 2. This Joshua chapter number 2 happened 40 years later. So this is 40 years, 40, 40, 40 years after the crossing of the Red Sea. There in Joshua chapter 2, uh, verse number 10. Joshua chapter 2 and verse 10, this is by no means a believer, this is Rahab. This is Rahab in the city of Jericho. Look what she said, Joshua 2 and verse 10. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. She's saying this to the two spies. When you came out of Egypt and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites and that were on the other side, Jordan, Sihon, and Og, whom you utterly destroyed... And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Forty years later, the lost world was still pointing back at the crossing of the Red Sea and said, that was God. You don't need Joshua, but turn, if you would, next to uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 51, the middle of your Bible should be Psalms, next is Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, then Isaiah, Isaiah chapter number 51. Isaiah chapter number 51, this is a statement that was made by Israel about the mighty hand of their God, again, Isaiah chapter 51. And uh, look, if you would, in verse number 10, Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 10. And there we read this statement, Are thou not it which hath dried the sea, the waters of the great deep that hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over? That's 220 years later. Here's my point, and then we'll get to the title, and then we get to the, we'll get to the meat of the word. But you know, they came to what looked to them like an impossible obstacle in their life. And some of them gave up at that point. Some of them thought not even God himself could solve this. And while they began to complain and say, Moses, how could you? Moses said, would you just stand still? Would you just watch what God is going to do in a situation that you think this is insurmountable. And you know, God led them through that, and 20 years later, they were still talking about what God did. 220 years later, Israel was still talking about what God did. And you know, as I read that, I thought, maybe there's someone here tonight. Maybe you are facing an impossible situation. And you're thinking, surely God has made a mistake. And maybe you're actually upset at God. God, how could you? 
let this happen in my life. And I want you to see that this sea became a sea of deliverance for those who still retain their faith in God. But hold on a minute. The same sea that was a sea of deliverance for Israel became a sea of destruction for that Egyptian army. Maybe tonight you're facing something and you're saying, Lord, I never would have picked this. I never would have thought this happened. Lord, I don't understand why you've allowed this to happen. And I say tonight, if you'll retain your faith in God, God will not only get you past this impossible situation, but in time to come you will look back on that and say, God and only God did this. If you're taking notes tonight, I know that some of you are taking notes. My title is A Sea of Deliverance or A Sea of Destruction. Again, A Sea of Deliverance or A Sea of Destruction. You know, uh, maybe you're facing something that seems impossible. Maybe there's others around you that are reminding you there's no way that you're going to get past this. And if that's the case, then I would remind you with God's help, if you'll do it God's way, and if you'll do it in God's time, then God's going to get you through this, and you're going to look back, and instead of being an obstacle, it'll be a trophy of what God can do. But if you're facing an impossible thing, and you're trying to now get through it without God's help, and you're doing it your way, and you're doing it in your timing, then this may be the very thing that you never get past. Again, for we that have been raised in Sunday school and we that have been raised in church, do you know, uh, this is a common story, the crossing of the Red Sea. And uh, they did, in times after, they looked back and said, that's God. But you know, there's a lot of people today that don't believe this miracle. There's a lot of skeptics today that don't believe the Bible and they try to come up with a logical explanation for what God declared was a miracle. Uh, maybe you've heard this before, this little boy went to a Sunday school and he believed the Bible, the little boy did, but he sat under a teacher that didn't. And the Sunday school teacher tried to teach this boy that it wasn't the Red Sea, but it was the Reed Sea. And see, it wasn't just, you know, some deep body of water that they crossed, but actually the water was really only, you know, hardly up to the knees. And, and so this teacher, this unbelieving teacher, tried to teach this little boy who did believe the Bible that it wasn't a Red Sea, it was a Reed Sea. And this little boy just kind of looked at this teacher and said, no, I'm not sure where you learned it, but I just believe the Bible. And he said, the truth is, what if you're saying is true, that takes more faith than what I'm saying. That teacher said, how so? That little boy said, for Pharaoh in his chariot and for his armies that were marching and for all those that were in their chariots, for all of them to drown in water that high, that would be a bigger miracle even than what I thought. Either way you cut it, it's God. Could it be tonight that you're facing something and you've pretty well just thrown up your hands and said, I quit. If your faith is in God, God will get you through it. He might not get you through it when you want him to, and he might not get you through it in the way you thought he would. But he'll get you through it. Trust him. Trust him. So again, we're looking here tonight at a sea of deliverance or a sea of destruction. Let's start there in Exodus 14, beginning in verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before, won't even try to say the word, between Migdal and the sea over against Baal Zephon, before it, shall, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. There's a lot of names in that verse 2, aren't there? And with all those names in verse 2, it's pretty obvious in verse 1, the Lord told them to go that way. The Lord said, I want you to go here. And then the Lord said, next, I want you to go here. And next, I want you to go here. And this instructions or directions as far as they went, they don't start in Exodus 14. Back up there, if you would, to Exodus chapter 12 and verse 37. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 37, we're given a few more details about the path that this nation was taking. Exodus 12, 37, the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses, that's where they were slaves in Egypt, to Sukkoth, uh, 
About 600,000 on foot, there were men besides children. So we read about Ramses and Sukkoth. Look there in Exodus chapter 13 and verse 20. It says, and they took their journey from Sukkoth, that's where they left us uh, before, and encamped in Etham. I'm trying to say this. We are given exactly the steps that this nation of Israel took. And I, I wish I had a map on the front. I always think of it when I'm preaching instead of before I'm preaching. But you're going to have to take my word for it, and you're going to have to check it later. But as they left Egypt, they went due east, and then they went south. So the journey that they're taking by those places we read in Exodus 12, 37, and 13, 20, and 14, 2, they are leaving Egypt, they're going east, and then they're turning south. Now, the difficulty with that is their ultimate destination is Canaan. And if you have pretty good with geography, geography would say they're supposed to go east, and then they're supposed to go north. Something's wrong. They're following the wrong directions logic would tell you and me. Uh, if you were a trucker, and you were supposed to take a load from Portage La Prairie, and that load was supposed to end up in Thompson. Now we're going to see how much you know Manitoba. If you were to go from Portage and go to Thompson, you know that you would first travel east, and then when you got to Winnipeg, you'd travel north. And so if you had to deliver a load like that, you have a pretty good idea of which directions you should be going. If your dispatcher said, I want you to take this road so many miles and take a right and take this road south so many miles, you'd say, hold on a minute. That's not going to end me in Thompson. That's going to get me through Grand Forks and take me through Fargo. You would scratch your head and say, somebody's made a mistake. Could I suggest to you that, uh, we're, again, we're looking tonight at the sea of deliverance or a sea of uh, destruction. First of all, if you're taking notes, we're looking at the path to the sea. The path to the sea. Could I give you a few words about the path that they're taking? First of all, it's a puzzling path. If you're taking notes, first thing is the path to the sea. First of all, it's a puzzling path. Do you know sometimes in our Christian life, God does not always take us in straight lines. Is that fair? I, I didn't become a pastor with a straight line from graduating from Bible Institute in 1983, until I started pastoring in 1990. First of all, it took seven years. That's an awful long trip. And it wasn't straight from Bible Institute to Portage La Prairie. It had a few turns in that. That's how God works. God doesn't always take us on straight lines. Sometimes the path that God takes us on is the first piece, is a puzzling path. And we can't always figure it out. Do you know we quote this verse, but I don't know how often we apply this verse. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. You know why we're told that? Because sometimes when we do what we believe God is telling us to do, it doesn't make sense. It's puzzling. We can't understand it. I'm giving you the first thing tonight about this sea of deliverance or a sea of destruction. The path to the sea. First of all, we see the path was a puzzling path. We say, Pastor, Moses must be giving the wrong directions. Moses must be directing them in the wrong way. And Moses must be confused. Again, we're looking at Exodus 14. Look at verse 1. Exodus 14, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses. It's not Moses that's giving these turns. It's God that's giving these turns. You say, preacher, I don't know what God's doing in my life. I would have thought by this time in my life, I would already have been. But preacher, I'm not even halfway there. In fact, I'm not even nowhere there. That's the way God works. We're looking, first of all, at the sea of deliverance or sea of destruction we're looking at the path to the sea. I said the first thing is it's a puzzling path. Could I give you another P under this first point? Not only is it a puzzling path, but it's a providentially 
led path. Providential is God. You say, what's God doing? It's God. Trust Him. Trust Him. It's a puzzling path. It's a providentially led path. Again, it seems that they're on zigzag lines and they're re-stepping and Moses wasn't the one that was giving these directions. It was God. You know, maybe... You say, well, maybe God only stepped in after Moses messed up. That's not true at all. Look there in Exodus 13 and verse number 20. And they took their journey from Sukkoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and led them away and by night in a pillar of fire. I'm saying it was not only a providentially led path, but it was a providentially confirmed path. God was right, the, the, the cloud was right there. He said, Pastor, I know that I'm in the will of God, but it's just not taking me where I thought it would. Trust Him, sometimes the path is a puzzling path. If you're in the will of God, it's a providentially led path and a providentially confirmed path. There will be times where God will say, you're on track, don't worry. Lord, when are we going to fix this? It doesn't always happen when you thought. It doesn't always happen how that you thought. But not only do we see that it was a puzzling path and also see that it was a providentially led and confirmed path, but you know all the while that Israel journeyed this path, it was also a testing or a, another P, a proving path. Again, they're, they're not going east and north. They're going east and south. And I'm sure that there were some in that nation of Israel that looked at Moses and said, you are not fit to lead us. You're taking us in a way that's completely contrary to logic and good sense. And it was a test of Moses to continue to lead as God told him instead of caving in to the complaints of people. If you've been in any kind of leadership spiritually, you will try to lead as God has told you to lead and there will be always somebody that questions your leadership. So it was a proving path. It was going to prove Moses whether he'd follow God or cave in to the whims of people. But it was also proving those people in the wilderness. And folks, God has put people, if you're a child, if you're a young person, God has put a parent in your life or parents. And you better trust that God's going to use those parents to direct you in your life. If you're a Christian in a church, God's given you a pastor and other leaders in the church. So I just don't think it's a proving path. It's a puzzling path. It's a providentially led and providentially confirmed path. It's a proving path. But could I say to you, it's also a purposeful path. God was going to use this to destroy those Egyptian army. There was a purpose for this. Preacher, I, I don't understand what God is accomplishing. I'm supposed to go that way, and I'm here, and God has a purpose in this path. The Jews didn't understand it. They didn't understand that this sea, God not only was going to take them through the sea, but God was going to completely crush the enemy that was chasing them with the same sea. And I say to you that God has a purpose if you're not going from point A to point B, but if it's just taking you somewhere else, God has a purpose. Trust Him. I give you the second thing that we notice about this sea. Not only have we notice the path to the sea, but look there in Exodus 14 and verse 9. Exodus chapter 14 and verse 9, but the Egyptians pursued after them. All the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army overtook and uh, sorry and overtook them in camping by the sea. And we have some more names there. Do you know the second thing we notice? Not only was this path that they were on a puzzling one, a perilous one, but it was secondly a perilous one. If you're writing notes, secondly, would you write the peril to the sea? Peril is danger. Peril is trouble. Peril is adversity. 
You know, as they were following the directions of Moses, who was following the direction of God, they couldn't imagine that there'd be any troubles in following God. But to the contrary, they had an entire army that was angry with them, that was pursuing after them. And we know that Pharaoh's intention was to bring them back to Egypt. And if he couldn't bring them back to Egypt, he'd just as soon kill them. I'm talking about, secondly, the peril to the sea. And he said, Preacher, I, I believe I'm following the steps of God. But Pastor, why is there still trouble? 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer, what's the last word? Persecution. You can be in the perfect will of God, and there's still obstacles. There's still troubles, and there's still things that won't make sense. Say, Pastor, I thought when I got saved, and I thought when I surrendered to do whatever God wants, I thought it would be smooth sailing. The preacher, it's not. When you're trying to do the will of God, it's not always an easy thing. Trust him. I say we have seen already, one, the path to the sea. And secondly, the peril to the sea. Richard, why is it that there is any opposition to God's people? Now, wouldn't you think this? Wouldn't you think if you decided to live for the Lord, you decided you wanted to do God's will, wouldn't you think that folks would be excited about that? Well, we're given a little hint why Pharaoh hated these Israelites so much. Look there in Exodus 14 and verse 4. God says, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he shall follow after them, after Israel. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. Do you know the very first thing why you have enemies, in spite of the fact that you're trying to do what's right? Is there are some people in this world that's heart is hardened toward God. Folks, as much as you love God, or at least ought to love God, there are people that hate God as much as you love God. And as much as you want to find the will of God and accomplish the will of God and bear fruit in doing the will, as much as you desire God, there's actually people out there that hate God. I'm saying the first reason why there was such opposition is because Pharaoh hated God. And because he hated God so much, Pharaoh wanted to hurt those that love God in any way that he could. And the second reason is anyone who lives in bondage is envious of those that are free. Now, so why is there such opposition? Why is there peril on the way to the sea? Well, first of all, there's people that hate God. If they hate God, they'll hate you. They'll do everything they can to hurt you, to stop you, to discourage you. But folks, as Christians, we're free. We're not bound by the vices of sin unless we have let sin take us. We're not, we're not, uh, we're not caught in the, in the chains of sin unless you've let sin chain you. And so, folks, we're free. As Christians, we're free. How many times Paul talked about our liberty? And yet, do you know that there are people that are still bound and they can't stand people that are free? We've seen, first of all, the path to the sea. It's a puzzling path. It's a providentially led path. It's a purposeful path. It's a proving path. We've seen, secondly, the peril to the sea. There's motivation against God's people. It's hate. And you know, look there again in Exodus 14. Exodus chapter number 14. Again, verse 9. Look, let's see how much Pharaoh hated these Jews. Exodus 14, verse 9. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh. Boy, he used everything he could to stop Israel. You know, this world will use everything it can to stop you. It'll use discouragement. 
And it'll use, uh, it'll use enticement, and it'll use money, and it'll use bad friends, and lust, and all the rest of that. Pastor, it's, it's, it seems such a fight to stay on the path. Well, that's because there's an enemy. I think it's 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9, for uh, uh, a great and effectual door is open unto me, and there's many adversaries. Say, preacher, I just got saved in the last year. It's great to be a Christian. Sure it is, and it'll always be great to be a Christian. But the longer that you're saved, it'll seem like you accumulate more opposition. We've seen the path to the sea. We've seen the perils to the sea. And uh, look there, if you would, in uh, Exodus 14, verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they, Israel, were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. See, preacher, I've never faced this before. Well, how are you responding? I gave you a third. The third P is the plea, P-L-E-A, the plea at the sea. When they finally came face to face with this massive body of water that was impossible for two million people to cross, how did they respond? How are you responding in the situation that you are finding yourself? Preacher, I can't believe that God would do that. Well, how are you responding? What, what, what's, what's your prayer? What's your plea? Let's see what they do. Again, Exodus 14 and verse 10. End of the verse, it says, And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. That's a good thing. You know what they did? They, they began to pray. They began to talk to God. God, I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't understand why this happened. Lord, why? that's a good thing. And if you're facing something that you've never faced before, it, it might just drive you to your knees as you've never been driven before. You know, if you're heavy of heart, the very best thing you could do is talk to God. That's a good thing, but it didn't stop there. Look at verse 11, Exodus 14, verse 11. And, and so after they poured their heart unto God, the end of verse 10, and they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us? to carry us forth out of Egypt. You know, it's a good thing that they began to talk to God and ask God, Lord, what's happening? <laughs> Lord, would you help me? Lord, would you direct me? That's a good thing. But you know, the second thing they did wasn't a good thing. They began to point at Moses who had led them thus far, and it says there in verse number 11, look again at it if you would, and they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry? You know, the second thing they began to do is they began to criticize. <laughs> they began to point their fingers and say, it's your fault, and it's your fault, and Moses, it's your fault. And you know any Christians that are doing that? You know any Christians that in their life it's taken a turn and something they never imagined? And yes, they're calling out to God for God to help them, but they're pointing fingers. Maybe it's at their husband, it's your fault. Maybe it's at your wife, it's your fault. If it hadn't been for you, that's what they were doing. And isn't that so much like human nature? And I say to you, you might be facing something, some great sea that you've never faced before, but I wonder, and we learned here, the first thing about the plea at the sea, we notice that they're blaming others. They're blaming others. Listen, if you have, if you have been following God's will and God took a turn and had you take a turn you didn't expect, that's not the time to point fingers at others. That's time to say, Lord, I don't, don't, no, I don't know what you're doing. But I trust you. I trust you. So first of all, they were blaming others. Not only were they blaming others, but there's a second thing that we notice here, if you would, in... Uh, uh, look there in verse number 11. Verse number 11. 
They said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, thou hast taken us away to die in the wilderness. Hold on a minute. Who told you you were going to die out here? Well, that's, I know that's going to happen. <laughs> God tell you that? No. Moses tell you that? No. Any leadership told you that? No. Do you know not only this plea, when they're face to face with the sea, they're blaming others, but secondly, they're betting <laughs> that this is a complete disaster. Now, I know Christians don't bet, but it starts with B. You know what I mean, like, huh? Facing someone like they, something they've never faced before, and they're blaming others. It's your fault, it's your fault. It's your f if you hadn't have done that, this wouldn't have been like this. And then they're so, so sure it's going to end in total disaster. This whole thing is a complete disaster. Well, who told you that? If God is the one that is leading you in your life, it's not a disaster at all. God is going to accomplish something through all of this. Trust Him. I say the third thing that we notice, we've already seen the path to the sea. We've already seen the peril to the sea. We see now the plea at the sea. So while some were blaming and some were betting on a negative outcome, how different Moses was. Look there in Exodus 14, verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Oh, what a difference in the spirit of Moses to the spirit of so many of those people. Oh, we're, we're just going to die here. <laughs> and Moses said, you're not going to die here. God's still in control. He's not on vacation. He knows what's happening. He said, in fact, not only are you not going to die here, God is going to do a supernatural miracle here. He's going to get you to the other side completely safe. And the enemy is going to die here. You know, we have seen third, he, uh, the plea at the sea. While well, some were blaming others and betting on a negative outcome, Moses provided a much better response. And again, notice what he says there again in verse number 13. Moses said unto the people, fear ye not, so just relax. <laughs> fear ye not, stand still. Don't we struggle with that? You know, when we find ourselves in a situation, we think we have to do something. No, sometimes the only thing you have to do is just stand still. Stand still, he says, and see the salvation of the Lord. I pastored 31 years. Some of you have been in my office, and you've described the sea that you're standing before. Preacher, what can I do? And a lot of times I said, I don't think you can do do anything. I think you just have to stand still. Now, to stand still means don't run away from it. To stand still means you're just going to have to let God do it. And again, that's so contrary. We want to do something. But he said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. His was far better advice and the rest of those Jews that were blaming and the rest of those Jews that were betting that this was going to be such a negative outcome having said that look at verse number 21 Exodus chapter 14 and verse 21 and Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night made the sea dry land and the waters were divided, verse 22. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. God did what they thought was impossible to do. Again, we that have been raised in church and Sunday school, we know the story. We know that Moses... Contrary to the logic of those people, Moses said, just watch, watch what God does. 
And then Moses turns to God and says, okay, God, what are you going to do? I, I wish it were true that everybody, I wish it was true that every parent knew how the problems were going to be fixed. I wish it true were true that every pastor knew what the outcome was going to be and those in leadership of the church knew what the outcome... And Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Moses doesn't himself know what God's going to do. So God, what are we going to do? And God says, that staff that's in your hand, why don't you just hold that up? And Moses holds that up and an east wind begins and it begins to part that water and God does something that they thought was absolutely impossible. They didn't think the answer was that way. Maybe they thought that God would just destroy the Egyptian army, just like that. And so they could head out that way. You know, whatever way you think that God's going to get you through this, it might not be at all the way God's going to do it. They say, Pastor, that's the way I would do it. Aren't you glad God's not you? But you're going to have to wait on God. The Bible says God brought an east wind. That east wind began to blow on those waters, and it blew all night long. Well, that means it didn't happen like that. That means maybe they watched, maybe, maybe they complained, Lord, it's too, Moses, what's going on here? Moses, look at this. We were a little more comfortable 20 minutes ago. Now, whoa, Lord. God might do it and it might be a little inconvenient. It might be a little difficult. But the answer is not to run. The answer is to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And sure enough, God got them through that that next day on dry land. And you know, Egypt and the armies made a mistake. Look there, if you would, in, in verse number 23, Exodus 14, 23. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea. Now, hold on a minute. God told Israel to go through it. But God never told Egypt to go through it. And maybe there was someone in Egypt, maybe Pharaoh thought, maybe he thought, well, if God did that for them, God will do that for us. God is going to do for his people whom God picks, and no one else better assume that God's going to do that for them too. And so Pharaoh decides, let's t if, if they went through on dry land, we can go through on dry land. But instead of being delivered from that, look there in verse number 26, well, back up, let's not miss anything. Verse 24 and it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked uh, unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and, and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels that they drove, uh, drave them heavily so that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians and the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thy hand over the sea that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength. When the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians into the midst of the sea, I'm saying to you that very same sea that became a sea of deliverance for a nation of people that just trusted God. Contrary to reason, contrary to common sense, they had their faith in God. But to that other group of people, the Egyptians, who didn't have faith in God, and just presumed upon God's power, well, they were drowned in that. Last thing we see in our text is the parting of the sea. And whatever impossible circumstance it might be that you face, the sea that you stand before is no mistake. God allowed it. God led you to this point. God is watching what you do while you face it. This sea that stands before you is either going to make you or it's going to break you. God is testing you at the sea. 
God is asking you to stay put and stay faithful. Wait upon God and wait upon His way and wait upon His timing. You know, your faithfulness at that sea will either end in a sea of deliverance. And you look back upon it and say, man, God was... I didn't think that God could, but God can. It'll either be a sea of deliverance or you're going to get cold feet on the side of that sea and decide God doesn't know what he's doing and God's messed up and he should have never brought me this way. And what's a sea of deliverance is going to become a sea of destruction. What sea are you standing before? If you're questioning your mind, how could God do this? You're not going to get through the sea. If you're trying to blame others and say it's his fault and it's her fault, and you're still losing ground at the sea, but if you're saying, God, I know you've allowed it. Lord, although I don't understand why you've allowed it, I trust you. What a great thing to trust the Lord. You know, sometimes God brings us to the end of ourself. Maybe someone here, maybe you have lots of money. I don't think anyone here. Maybe you have lots of money. And your money has always bought you out of every trouble that you've had. God is going to bring you to a situation where all the money in the world won't get it out. It might be a health thing and all the money in the world can't buy a doctor to fix it. It, it, it might be a domestic situation. I don't know what it is. You might, to this point, have always been able to get out of every situation, God in his providence is going to bring you to a sea and he's going to tell you to just stay put and trust me. He's going to bring you to the end of every resource that you always counted on. I was reading this week, trying to find an illustration. There is a 35-year-old man. His name is Michael Francis. He was one of the most powerful mafia bosses in this country. He had grown up in a world of corruption and violence. Oh, sure, people had tried to witness to him about Christ. He just laughed. He had no place for God. He was arrested one day, and he was taken a court, and he couldn't buy his way out of it. It was some kind of a gas tax scam that he was involved in. And he was sent to prison. And you know, by his testimony afterwards, because of how dangerous he was and how many enemies in that prison that he had made, they put him in solitary confinement. And all that he had in solitary confinement was his bed, a table, a chair, and a Bible. <laughs> and when he walked in there and they locked that door behind him, he looked at, these, he looked at the Bible and he threw it in the corner. He said, I don't need that. He didn't believe in God he didn't believe the Bible. And, you know, weeks passed and months passed, and the Bible was still there. And he said this. He said, you know, it turned out I spent 35 months and 13 days in prison. 29 of those months and seven days, he said, I was in a six by eight foot hole, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And he said, I couldn't argue with anyone. I couldn't blame anyone. I couldn't buy my way out of that. And he said, I realized it was just me and God. And he said, I didn't come by believing God very easily. He said, I challenged God. He said, I argued with God. He said, I swore at God. He said, I wasn't a believer when I went in. But he said, you know, after the 35 months in that prison... While it was there, only God knows how many times I picked up that Bible and began to read it. And he said, I came out of there believing that that Bible is God's word and that Jesus is my risen Savior. And when he got out, there was an interviewer that went and asked, so that prison cell, are you saying, was good for you? And he said, God saved my life in that cell. I'm thankful for that cell. Maybe you're looking at something right now and say, I could never, ever, ever thank God for this. 
God brought you to the sea. Now he's going to find what you're going to do at the sea. Don't run. Don't lose your faith in God. Don't make up an answer and tell everybody that God said, wait, stand still, and watch God do what only God can do. Your head's bowed, your eyes closed. Father, we've looked tonight at a very familiar part of the Bible, at least the story is, the crossing of the Red Sea. We've looked at the path to the sea. Certainly it was a puzzling path, but it was a providentially led path. It was proving somebody, it had a purpose. Lord, we've seen the peril to the sea. There were enemies that hated God and hated Israel and wanted to use this to just knock Israel off of God's path. We've seen the plea at the sea. Some began to blame others. Some were betting that this was the end of them. We thank God that Moses saw a greater purpose in it all. Lord, we've seen the parting of the sea. God, because of those that simply stood still and waited on God, God opened it up. But that same sea that was a sea of deliverance to some became a sea of destruction for others. Lord, whatever it is each of us are facing tonight, if our faith is in God, we're waiting on God's way and God's timing, if we'll not run, God can part our sea just like God parted that Red Sea. Would you strengthen our faith?